Hi, this is uh, Jeff Pulver, and uh, we're getting ready to kick off day one of uh, Blue Lava 2022. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us from all over the world. We have an absolutely amazing set of days ahead of us, great connectivity uh, with people. And um, I'm super excited and particularly in, in, very interested in, and very uh, excited to listen to our very first uh, guest of the, of the event, Dean uh, Tribble, who's the uh, CEO of, of Agoric, will be joining us uh, shortly. I'd like to, but I just encourage all of you, if you'd like to uh, ask the uh, questions of our speakers, please tweet at them. Uh, they will be looking for tweets to, to their Twitter handle, so feel free to reach out to them. I'm at Jeff Pulver, and I'm really grateful to be here today to uh, to host this event. Uh, and we have wonderful hosts each day. The uh, updated uh, event schedule is viewable at bluelava.live. So please check out bluelava.live for the uh, our actively updated uh, events schedule. And uh, really, really grateful to be here. And we'll be uh, bringing on uh, Dean in a few moments. And uh, I'm just super excited about being present. And you know, the, the Web3 revolution is underway. Great technologies available. Wonderful opportunities for JavaScript developers to get involved and to do great things. And uh, truly, and it's really um, just grateful for the opportunity to be the, the host of the event and for all the speakers from around the world who will be participating, as well as our audience. And feel free to tweet out what you're hearing. Please feel free to put out comments. Please feel free to bring people, more people into the conversation. This is a conversation in which we are pioneering uh, in many ways. Uh, th this event is only on Twitter spaces and uh, we have great, you know, world-class speakers joining us during the conference. And it's, uh, I I'm just super excited to be here. And I'm, I, I just, I'm totally thrilled. Um, so each the the present the schedule today just to go over it so uh, everyone knows. Um, Dean will be uh, Dean is our first uh, speaker. Um, Dean will be followed by. Um, uh, um, Chris, I just want to get this right. Yeah, so D Dean is uh, going to be coming. Is going to be talking about smart contracts. We already know. Um, Chris is going to be coming talking about foundations uh, for hardened uh, JavaScript, and then Tom is going to be talking about practitioner's guide to hardened JavaScript. So there's a lot of JavaScript in the conversations today. Pl please feel free to tweet, tweet your questions to the speakers uh, during while they're talking. They'll follow. We'll follow up afterwards. If we can, we can address it during the during the during their talks there's a, a lot going on and uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Agora team thank you for sponsoring this event uh, thank you all for participating uh, and I want to just uh, see if I could uh, uh, Dean you're there I believe uh, could you uh, unmute I'd like to say hello 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 thank you for uh, for doing this uh, how how how, um, how are you these days I am I am just really really excited. I'm and I'm delighted. Thank you for having me here. This is uh, uh it it has been a long time vision to get lots and lots of developers out in the mainstream world into building smart contracts and 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 doing this this new kind of stuff. So I'm excited to start actually talking about it. Well, go ahead. The uh the virtual stage is yours, Dean. I'll be in the background and uh, the rest of the team will be in the background. The next 30 minutes is all you. So please go ahead. <laughs> well, hopefully the next 30 minutes 30 minutes isn't all me. We'll see if there's some, some, some questions and a bit of interactivity. I will start with one of my favorite questions, and then I'll actually get into intros. So if everyone uh, looks at their Twitter interface, somewhere in there, if you hold on, your, your, you can post a reaction. And so one of the reactions is the 100. Um, for everyone who has actually used a smart contract, set the reaction of 100. Right on 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 your user. It's like waving a hand. Only only you turn on the reaction of 100. Just to see how many people. Okay, I see two, three, four. Right. I see about the number I expected because most people don't realize that there's a lot more smart contracts in the world um, uh, than they were thinking that have nothing to do with blockchain. So first, let me introduce myself. I am I am as he said. I'm Dean Tribble. I'm CEO of Agoric. Agoric is a company that is building a what's called a layer one blockchain, and I'll get into that, but a, but a first class sovereign blockchain for doing smart contracts um, in the crypto space, but where the smart contracts are written in this hardened JavaScript that Chris Kowal 
myself and um, and and uh, uh, others will be talking about uh, occasionally throughout the throughout the the week. Now, it's only one of the many ways that JavaScript experts, JavaScript programmers, JavaScript dabblers can help contribute to the growth of this brand new ecosystem. But let's start, and so I'll go through, um, I'll, I'll, I'll lay some of the groundwork for this ecosystem to introduce you to to what the technology is, what's different and actually valuable about it in order to cut through some of the hype. And I'll then lay out some of the opportunities available to the JavaScript community out there to really change the world through this new technology step. So, so let's start with what's a smart contract? Because I asked a few people how much, you know, how, how, how likely or how, how have they done smart contracts before? But what a smart contract is, is a contract-like arrangement expressed in code, in software, where the behavior of that software enforces the terms of the contract. Now, nothing in that talks about blockchain because indeed that definition uh, we came up with years before. I worked on the first production smart contract back in 1989. And, uh, to, you know, and, and Agoric was founded by pioneers in the space of large scale distributed systems. So uh, our chief scientist, Mark Miller, wrote the Agoric Open Systems papers that really introduced the idea of software creating and participating in markets. We were, you know, various of us worked in early cyberspace, early voice over IP with, with Jeff, in fact. Um, or and in this particular case, early smart contracts. And the thing about that definition is, forget blockchain, eBay, PayPal, Venmo, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, all of those are a form of business where there's software that is intermediating and enforcing the terms of arrangements between uh, multiple parties, right? Between a bidder and a seller, between a rider and a driver. And there are millions of transactions on an ongoing basis where total strangers cooperate with each other successfully because of businesses with that architecture, businesses that are smart contracts. Now, prior to blockchain, if those smart contracts had to be implemented, operated by a trusted intermediary, right? You know, it was eBay that you would send your bids to, or eBay software, rather, that you'd send your bids to, and the sellers would post their item, and it would figure out who the winner was, and it would go through all the scheduled bidding and all these kinds of things in order to enrich the kinds of interaction they had. And yeah, some transactions would end up escalating to need dispute resolution. Some of that was a smart contract that was automated, and then eventually humans came into the picture, you know, to sort out some of them. But it was a very, very tiny fraction that were not completely enforced and enabled by software. And that vision of software helping to orchestrate interesting human cooperation, economic or otherwise, has been a vision that has been driving us and many other people in this industry for literally decades. And it's a vision that many people don't realize they've been pursuing as they build interesting, useful applications that happen to be smart contract and architecture, right? That happen to be, again, the Ebays, the, 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 the lifts and all that sort of thing. And so now smart contracts then are trillion dollar plus market cap before blockchain ever came along, right? Right? You know, huge, valuable business, huge, valuable relationship. Um, and, you know, I, I said I worked on the first production smart contract in 1989. That was before it was called that. And there was a group of cypherpunks that were all working and sharing these ideas. And Nick Zabo, you know, came up with a lot of these ideas independently. And he really characterized what is it that makes a smart contract smart? What is it that makes it useful? What is it that makes this new way of having software help human interaction and human cooperation valuable? And why should we do more of it? And indeed, we should do more of it, and the world has. And that's where the, 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 the term smart contract was born. So what does blockchain bring to this? So that's, by the way, smart contract. So feel free now, if you think you've used a smart contract, to vote again, to, you know, set the 100 on your, on your status, um, if indeed now you know you have already used a smart contract, even though you've never touched a blockchain, right? Okay, so, um, so what does blockchain bring to the party? Um, because people are really excited about it and people, you know, con confound the two. It really does make an interesting difference. So the gold standard of blockchain from, from at an abstract level that can help you cut through all the hype and think about, do I care about this? Is this important? Does this involve, help solve important problems? Is multiple independent computers, i.e. in different jurisdictions and different administrative domains, right? So that means that no one government organization or human can compromise the integrity of all of these computers, right? 
So multiple independent computers, you know, in, in these different uh, in countries, et cetera, vote or come to consensus. I'll go into a little more detail about the difference there, but vote to agree on data. Dean Tribble has a hundred bucks in his account. Order of events. Um, Dean Tribble bid in an auction and then tried to withdraw his, his auction, but the auction closed. Did the auction close before he withdrew or after he withdrew? You know, the result is important. And thus, vote to agree on the results of computation. I.e., does Dean Tribble still have 100 bucks in his account, or did he instead buy that cute crypto kitty, right? Whatever the hell it is. Right? Okay. And so the key thing of having all of these independent computers, you know, that are separately administered so that it's very difficult to, to, to suborn the system voting is... Well, the first thing is like, you know, uh, uh, you you um, execute really, really slowly. So these blockchains have, you know, the compute power of an old cell phone, but they execute with an integrity to their execution that nothing on the planet has ever achieved before. Right. It's not about, oh, I can build a hardened computer system and ship it to someone because now that someone is still utterly exposed to what I might have done to that system that they can't dig out. But if several people build systems and I rely on on the union of all of them voting, now I have combined my my um, uh, uh, safety in in each of them into the union of it rather than so it's so it's as strong as the strongest link, not the weakest link. Um, and that's and that's really important. So you have execution with an integrity that that you can otherwise not get except as a result of of blockchain. And that's pretty amazing. And so what that means is I can now take smart contracts, run them on a blockchain. And know that they can't be compromised so that the software does specify exactly what's going to happen in the terms of the agreement. And now I no longer need to have that trusted intermediary in the picture, right? I no, no longer need to have my international trade for electricity relying on Enron not sneaking transactions in at the, at, you know, at the close of business. I no longer need to have the trusted intermediary that's letting me do third party trade on tickets where there's fraud, where, they, where they're taking 35% of the deal, whether the best deals they take and give to their friends, all of those kinds of things. No, no, I can execute with much higher integrity than that. And that means you can do new kinds of business. Okay, so, so what's that integrity get you? There, is a, there was a study by uh, economists at RMIT University in Australia, the number two university in Australia, where they analyzed how much of industrial spend, how much of, of what we spend to build and ship things is spent on not creating value, but shall we per say protecting value, right? It is the cost of trust. It's the, it's the audits. It's the verification. It's the second eyes to check something. It's, it's, it's the numerous paperwork filings to make sure you're doing what you're, you're, you're supposed to be doing. Now, much of that is essential. Much of that is crucial to the economy function, right? So this is not about you can get all of that to go away, but it doesn't produce value. It only protects value. And if you could make all of that cheaper, you could produce the same amount of value with vastly less cost. And so they did the estimate to figure out how much this was. And the cost of all of those people doing all of that redundant work to make sure other people are not cheating on their contract arrangements is 35% annually, 32 trillion dollars worldwide. It's a huge number. And it's a huge number because it's important, because it's crucial that we protect value. But anything that you can convert to running in a high integrity environment such that now no one can corrupt it, so that the execution that you were expecting is the execution that must happen and no one can change it. And it takes a lot of work to do that. And it's critical to do it right and interface it to human processes correctly. But anything that you can get that way is dramatically lower cost. And these are big enough differences in numbers that now it's not just that you save a little money here and there, but you actually change the game, right? That's the quantity has a quality all its own. So for example, the World Economic Forum analyzed that if you could take chain of custody, right? The, the bill of lading transfers for freight around the world, right? So that's just one 
use case for for reducing the cost of trust. If you could take that and make it so that it was reliable, so that when someone stamped a, a, a particular uh, package or transferred a package from one person to the other, it was recorded indelibly in, in, in a blockchain in an auditable way, that would increase the world GDP by 5% and increase world trade by 15%. That we're talking trillions of dollars in increased value, not just cost savings, but actual improved coordination across the world, right? These are some huge opportunities that kind of opportunity will take a long time to get to, but it is the kind of thing that's at the heart of this difference. So if you're looking at a use case and it doesn't leverage the fact that with smart contracts, trust is safer. You can cooperate more safely with people that you know less about, right? That's the, that's the, the huge value of this. And now suddenly you can, sure, reduce costs, but more importantly, you can, you can have business arrangements with more people that you were not able to have business arrangements with before. So that makes it very exciting. Okay. So that's what a smart contract is. That's what blockchain brings. And so what are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce a few more elements uh, underneath. I, 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 should, I should highlight here. So Bitcoin is a smart contract, right? It is a smart contract. It is software that enforces the terms of digital asset transfer and creation uh, among multiple different parties. Um, now, it's a blockchain that implements essentially a single smart contract. Ethereum introduced the notion of being able to run arbitrary third-party smart contracts on the same environment. And so Ethereum, you know, really had this big step forward in opening up the safe smart contracts environment um, for, uh, uh, for the world. So, so we all owe, owe a huge value, a huge debt to that, but it's only one of many and it has many interesting limitations. Okay. So let me introduce a few more bits of technology and then we'll go into, into some of the opportunities. So the first bit of technology is I said voting, but it's not quite voting, right? So it is come to consensus in a way that is robust given all the measures of attacks that happen in the system. And voting is, you know, sort of kind of at the heart of all of that. But the fundamental thing is if I'm going to have a bunch of participants vote, we've got two problems we have to solve. One is we need to make sure that all of the participants get a limited number of votes. They can't just say, well, I'm actually a million people and my vote is this, so it, you know, so, so it goes my way. And someone else says, no, no, well, I'm 10 million people, so here, my vote is this, right? You, and this is what's called the Sybil problem of, of someone representing themselves as being multiple parties. And, and the second is what, what we call equivocation. There's a few others, but those are the two core parts of it where this is all in large scale distributed systems where not everyone can talk to everyone and not everyone talks to a central node because why would you trust the central node? The whole point is to be in multiple places, decentralized, where you're in multiple places that are independent of each other so that they can't be compromised at the same time. And in that scenario, I could say one answer to one person, Dean got his money back before the auction completed, and a different answer to the other person, the auction completed and Dean should get awarded the prize. And now I have equivocated. I, had, I have voted differently to different parties, and they're all trying to figure out with each other what happened. And so they're looking for, did the collective decide that Dean got his money back or that Dean won the auction? Which one is it? And if people are lying to each other or, or rather claiming different things, it's hard to establish an agreement agreement about what happened. And so one of the things that, that blockchain has done is it has substantially advanced that part of computer science that started with the Paxos algorithm and really pushed it forward to, you know, this Byzantine environment where people are all trying to lie to each other and making sure that you get the right answer out of it anyway. And so if you are a deep computer scientist that happens to be a JavaScript programmer, there's a lot of really interesting research and a lot of really interesting open continuing new opportunities there um, to explore stuff. So there are different consensus mechanisms for solving this civil problem and the equivocation problem. You've, heard, you've probably heard of proof of work. This is what Bitcoin does and Ethereum does. And that's where miners, as they are called, essentially my summary is they race to solve a puzzle um, where the puzzle is, is, is part of, of approving the next block of transactions. So each miner, as it's called, you know, has, has the old chain, the, the old state of the chain, a set of transactions they want to add. In, in the case of one miner, it's, it's, you know, Dean won the auction. In the case of the other miner, it's Dean withdrew his money, right? Um, and only one of those happens. And they have, they have those transactions, a cryptographic hash of that, and 
the, a, a pointer to their bank account to get rewards sent to it and a random number. And they're computing a cryptographic puzzle across all of that, which happens to be, you know, do a hash and make sure that the first, you know, 10 uh, 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 digits of the hash are zero, right? The details don't matter very much. It's the key thing that, that they're generating a random number, see if it solves the problem. If it doesn't, they generate a random number and, and, and just recur. And so they do a whole bunch of work racing to solve that puzzle and whoever wins it publishes it and everyone goes, yay, there's a new block. And then they start doing the same puzzle on the next block. Okay, it's not quite that simple, but that's the kind of thing that happens. And that's proof of work. And because they are racing with all their computational might in order to get to this puzzle, that costs a lot of energy. And that's why it's proof of work is that you can't have, you can't have come up with a solution to this puzzle without having done a lot of work. And the fact that you came up with a solution is proof that you did so. And that prevents Sybil because you can only afford to do so much work with the computers you have. You can't pretend to be two parties without simply having double the computers. And so you're bounded on your resources to how many computers you can have working for you. And that's the bound on the number of votes. And that, that also means you're adding that level of security. So you getting that kind of number of votes is fine. And so that's one of the ways to, to prevent Sybil and prevent equivocation because your vote is you solve the puzzle, here it is, and, and if you want to do that twice with two different votes, you need twice as much work and you can't afford that, right? Okay, and there was a nice example uh, or a nice illustration of, of the proof of work scheme that someone did at RSA where they had a video of the beginning of the RSA conference where there was just the, the opening booth or the place to you know get your badges and everyone's kind of milling around. And has it got time for the conference to start, um, people started going, I'm not sure where the line is, I'm just gonna get in line here, right? And, they, and, and they'd get in line and, they'd, and, and the next person is like, I'm not sure where the line is, but there's someone standing over there, I'll go stand behind them. And you could see in the video, people looking behind them to confirm that they were in the right line by how many people had lined up behind them. And someone came along and started another line and they were like, oh wait, I guess we're in the wrong line, and all that sort of stuff. It's exactly how proof of work looks. Proof of work look. uh, so proof of stake, is where you prevent Sybil by putting cash on the barrel head, right? So, so your votes tie to how much information, how much money is tied up in your proposal that this is the next block and that you have only voted once. And in order to vote, you had to sign a document. And so someone can prove if you said one thing to one party and a different thing to another party, they can prove once those votes come together that you had two different conflicting votes and therefore you lose the cash that you put on the barrel head. And that's proof of stake where you actually are putting money down saying, I'm gonna act faithfully to the system, I'm going to execute correctly, and if anyone can prove otherwise, then, then I lose my money. Um, if I indeed act correctly the system, then I earn money based on the, the stake that I put down. And so the detailed economics of it are beyond the scope of this conference, but the key thing is that does not cost the same energy. Instead, it requires assets tied up in money. And so that's, so, so if people have heard about the world of, oh my gosh, you know, blockchain is burning down the planet. No, no, there are proof of stake systems, proof of work systems that are high energy, and there's some high security to it, and there's some value to that, and we can debate that later. But most of the modern systems are proof of stake that do not have any, you know, significant, interesting energy impact. Um, they, they achieve their protection against civil in different ways. Okay, so I'll add one more thing, and I guess I'm running out of time here, so I will add it real quickly. Um, the main thing that happens in order to achieve this, th this consensus is you have execution on these multiple different machines where they're executing the same thing and coming to the same answer and then voting to agree on it. In order to do so, you must have deterministic computation. So one of the reasons why early systems used random languages or special languages for these purposes, you know, that, that's sort of painful for adoption, but they did that so they could be deterministic, so that given the same inputs, it would compute the same outputs every single time. Um, one of the things we've done at Agoric, and you'll hear some about that probably in the discussion of, of hardened JavaScript, is we've been able to achieve essentially the same thing for JavaScript, where we can run in a mode where computation is de deterministic, which means you can run the same JavaScript program on multiple machines. They will vote to agree on the results of the answers, and that enables us uniquely to build a, a, a blockchain that uses JavaScript. The important thing is, Programming smart contracts in JavaScript, that's a huge open window where suddenly we can go from, you know, 10,000 or so developers that will ever be able to program a good smart contract in the programming language Solidity for Ethereum up to 
the millions of developers out there that every day do innovation or fintech or what have you in JavaScript. But there's a lot more opportunities for JavaScript than just the smart contracts, right? As with any new industry where, you know, some engineer got a great idea and they went off and did it, and then they built a user interface, and a normal human goes and looks at that user interface, and I'm speaking as an engineer here, a normal human goes and looks at that interface and says, oh my God, I can't use this, this is crazy. Um, and it's only, you know, it's, it's a user interface that only a robot could love. Um, uh, you know, that, that's great. It gets it out there. It means we could do, you know, literally blockchain is now trillion dollar plus market cap with multiple blockchains in the, in the hundred billion dollars. So there's real value there and real opportunity, even if, you know, chunks of it are, you know, seem crazy from the outside, but the core of it, same as when the internet came out, there was all sorts of cruft, right? But man, the core of it was hugely valuable. We're kind of like the 1993 in the internet where it's just beginning to blossom, just beginning to show off the power, powerful use cases. But that also means that the usability, the connectivity to real world systems, all of those things are just at their beginning. And so that's the second place where you all come in, which is, you know, the, the, the height of UI for many chains is I go through a nice user interface. Well, I go through an okay user interface. I like if I'm doing a trade of one asset for another, I'll pick ETH and I'll say I want to trade, you know, 10 ETH for 300 atoms. Those are two different tokens from two different blockchains. I want to I want to trade those and then I push a button and it pops up an interface which says so you wanted to send 10 ETH to 0x9547367 I don't know maybe that I guess that's what I'm supposed to do as a user interface that's just terrible it's sort of unimaginable that we will ever roll that out to to as many people as we have even succeeded as to so far but as, as the world moves forward to want to use this technology, this high integrity technology for more and more purposes, that's just not acceptable, right? The UX is not acceptable. And the exciting thing to us about that large JavaScript developer community out there is not only are they able to, to understand lots and lots of use cases that they're already embedded in and they're already innovating in, but they've got you know, deeper training in UX. They spent more time with the users. They spent more time with the customer base. And, um, and as a result, um, you know, once, once they start coming in, we'll get to see those use cases working smoother, those, those customers more able to safely use the system. So there's a lot of other uh, uh, opportunities for JavaScript developers in this context. You'll hear about um, the graph uh, later on in this week, which is a GraphQL style database for accessing data about blockchains. You know, that's very familiar to many people uh, in the JavaScript developer space. You'll hear about, you know, we, we, we at Onagoric, we use a component, component model very similar to React. So not only can you write smart contracts, but you can write smart contract components and build them and put them together where the affordances are about digital assets and, and trading and price rather than mouse clicks and rendering, but it's that same familiar model that we expect out of a modern framework using all the, all the familiar tool. Um, you'll, you know, you'll hear about bridges and interoperability where from my perspective, right, blockchains are not the be all and end all. That's just another computer made out of agreement among the other, among, among the underlying machines right, made out of agreement rather than made out of silicon, right? And so, all of the interoperability work, all of the machine to machine communication architectures and, and, and stuff like that that we've used in the rest of the economic world, we can use those same ideas between blockchains in order to have, you know, the, the, the assets on one blockchain, whether it's cash or finance or loans or games or what have you, to be able to make them available to cloud services, make them available to, to services on other blockchains, et cetera. So there's a lot of opportunity there. I'm really excited to see what people build. Um, please bring your expertise um, and, and add value. But as with any new industry, of course, um, the key thing is, you know, combine your expertise with humility about the new environment because there are new things to learn here. There are new architectures and we're all very excited for you to come in and grow them and change them. But make sure you see where the nuggets are to be able to build from rather than rather than uh, um, rather than assuming it's uh, 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 it's already familiar. There's some very cool stuff to learn and then grow from and, and bring your, and apply your expertise to. So thank you all for for paying attention for so long. And uh, please feel free to send questions now or later. Uh, Dina, do you want questions tweeted to you, or what, what's the best way to uh, to send questions? 
I think tweeted to me is it would be great. And if if any of them have already come through or tweeted on the the Blue Lava channel, and if if any have already come through, um, then Santi do, can read them out here. Yeah, I do see a quick question. So I, I think um, um, it was around you know some of the vulnerabilities and issues that smart contracts still have today, and how um, <laughs> you know how how developers coming into this space can uh, mitigate those or prepare for some of the same issues that, you know, maybe more experienced developers are still facing? That is a great question. So I will start, so Solidity is is the programming language for Ethereum. And I will warn you ahead of time, many people who program Solidity will claim that, you know, Solidity is like JavaScript. Let me tell you, Solidity is not like JavaScript. Other than like C, it uses curly braces, right? Otherwise it's, you know, it's it's like JavaScript the way, the same way all languages are like each other in von Neumann and whatever, right? Um, so, you know, don't, don't get fooled by that. Particularly, there are key architectural elements that to my mind, to our mind, limit what you can do in Solidity. So many of the security issues are intrinsic in the architecture of the particular platform you choose. They are not intrinsic to blockchain, right? In Solidity, um, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of smart contracts built painfully and tested and battle tested on Solidity, but they lost billions of dollars at a time to reentrancy bugs that you simply shouldn't be able to express if the language didn't allow reentrancy. So other people, especially Agoric, you know, we've been railing against reentrancy for a long time. Our, 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 our lead engineer was on the security review for, for Ethereum and pointed out that they were going to have reentrancy bugs and, and indeed, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at a time have been lost to them. But, but, Agora doesn't have it. Um, you know, Juno followed suit, followed suit, and it does uh, WASM smart contracts, and it doesn't have reentrancy bugs. So find the right platform, or be very careful in how you code. But again, there's lots of opportunities that are not just building new new smart contracts, but are building the interface to the existing ones that have already been hardened. But the main way to be secure is to use the right foundations um, and then use careful practices. And for it for us to grow the use of blockchain beyond thousands of developers into millions of developers, you know, we've got to pick and grow the right platform uh, uh, for so so that some of these security hazards are simply not present. Great. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour, uh, Santi. Do we want to uh, bring on Chris, or do you want to take another question? Do another question. Uh, I think uh, let's bring on Chris. Let's try and keep uh, on schedule. <laughs> <laughs> it's never easy. And, and uh, Chris is our expert at hardened JavaScript, so so uh, I'm excited to hear him as well. 